Before we jump into the booktube video, I just wanted to pop in really quick to let y'all know that the vegan food channel that I keep hyping is actually real and live and the very first video went up today. It is a mac and cheese recipe video where I show you how to make this very lovely mac and cheese spelled with a Z because we're vegan, don't you know? <laughs> So if you're interested in that, I'll have it linked down below in the description of this video. If not, just ignore this announcement and we'll carry on now with the booktube video. Finally learned my lesson. I, I don't like the shattered sea very much. So, so good. I didn't like either very much. This book let me down. So far in 2022, that is just, uh, that's not been the case. December wrap up. Final wrap up of 2020. One. I've been getting into the habit of saying 2022. Now I have to say 2021 again, <laughs> very briefly. But uh, yeah, so I ended the year with an insane amount of books in one month. Um, I'm hoping to read slightly less books every month so I have more time to just breathe and live and savor and etc. and not be scrambling. So far in 2022, that is just, uh, that's not been the case, but you know, we're trying. So my final count for the year in 2021 was 177 books. A couple of those were duplicates insofar as I read them twice within 2021. So I think individual books, it was like 174, 175, something like that. Let me know. I was thinking last year I did a video of like all of the books that I read, kind of going through them. I thought about doing that or alternatively tier ranking all the books that I read. So if that's something you'd like, let me know and I'll, I'll do it. If you you'd rather not, then I won't do it. But anyway, today, 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 we are here, I am here, to discuss the books that I read in December. Um, I actually haven't counted how many I read in December. It was 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 17. 17. Not the most I ever read in a month in 2021, not the least. So uh, yeah, without further ado, let us be about the business. So the first book I read in December was actually my November TBR and it bothered me that I didn't read it or finish it because I really wanted to. So I just stuck it on uh, to the beginning of December, uh, which in general, I want to do. Just because I don't get to it in a, in a given month, it doesn't mean I don't still want to read it. And so my TBRs were just too, it's another reason for lower TBRs, because in the event that even with a smaller TBR, there is a book that I don't quite get to, I would like to have the room to just like add it on to the next month. But I couldn't do that in 2021 because every single month my TBR was burst. <laughs> anyway, all that to say, my remnant of November that was read in December was Hamnet by Maggie O'Farrell. This book let me down. A patron of mine very kindly sent me this book, which I very much appreciate. Also, I'm glad that I didn't spend money on it. Uh, it's not, that makes it sound atrocious. It's not atrocious. It's, it's definitely not. It's not like it belonged on my worst books of the year or anything like that. But I feel like both because the subject matter itself is something that I'm particularly interested and invested in, and then this book specifically was quite hyped, sort of all over the place. And I think it was, if not, if it didn't win, I think it was nominated for a bunch of awards. It's uh, New York Times book review, 10 best books of 2020. I saw a lot of uh, YouTube channels, some of them not really the types of channels that uh, read what I read, but I like to expose myself to the fact that other people read things that I don't need, even if that doesn't get me to pick it up. Because this is more like lit -ficky. Anyway, all that to say, I pretty much saw universal praise for this and not just like universal blanking, just universal gushing. And so this is, okay, if you don't know anything about this, Hamnet is the story of, or a fictionalized, it's, it's, it's an imagined kind of a, I mean, it's, it's historical fiction, um, but it's to do with um, the death of Shakespeare's son, Hamnet which history tells us is what inspired at the very least the name of the play Hamlet. And I'd always known that Shakespeare had a son named Hamnet who died and that we got the play Hamlet. And I was never really sure how a young child dying would inspire the play of Hamlet. Like if you know Hamlet, the story, who it's about, what it's about, I just, I don't see the connection. Like the only, I mean, obviously the name for sure, Hamlet, Hamnet, which I'm given to believe were kind of interchangeable in the time. But in any event, I, I was like, I don't, I don't get it. <laughs> I don't get how your, the death of your small young son, who is a child, um, results in Hamlet the play. So I was hoping, in addition to the fact that this book was just praised in general, so I was looking forward to a good book. I was also looking forward to hopefully understanding a little bit better how, like, the connection there. And I was neither impressed with this, nor do I really, I'm still baffled as to how these, uh, how the one led to the other. And this book does at the end kind of try to explain that. 
which obviously, I mean, this is all historical fiction, so it's all just sort of like the author imagining or playing uh, a thought exercise of like what might have happened, what might these people have thought, etc. Because we don't we don't have a ton to go on when it comes to the personal life of William Shakespeare. So the author does kind of have a moment towards the end where the characters are or a character is like they're making the connection about why why Hamnet's death is the is the genesis of the catalyst for Hamlet the play and I was already I mean it was towards the end and I'd already been like I'm not impressed with this book and when I got there I was like nah that's that's really a stretch that's that's quite a quite a leap so yeah I don't know like obviously like this is what really happened so like there is some kind of a connection or at least I mean, the mind is kind of strange, just like in a conversation when you're like, how did we get onto this topic when we started out talking about this? So like, in that way, I get why like maybe just general grief would would make someone pour all of their emotions and thoughts into their creative endeavors, but not necessarily emulating real life. Maybe it's so it's different from real life because they're trying to avoid the triggering things of what really happened to them. I don't know. But point being, the connections this book tries to make between Hamnet's death and Hamlet the play, I'm like, that's tenuous at best. And up to that point, I just, I kept waiting for the moment when I would go, oh, okay, no, it's hitting. Now I, now I get why people praise this book. And I just, I didn't. The whole thing felt very like try hard. Like it, and it, it took so long telling, it kept jumping around. It goes out of its way to not mention Shakespeare's name. But everyone knows that's who they're talking about. But you know, this is Hamnet's book, so we're not going to talk about Shakespeare, which again felt like one of those like literary choices of like, well, we, we won't even mention the name of Shakespeare because it's not about him, even though it's like, oh, that's why we're reading it. Like, that's why anybody's interested in this story. And I also kept thinking to myself, like, how much of a story is there to a kid dying of the plague? Because that's what happened. A lot of people died of the plague, ha uh, Shakespeare's son being one of them. And I was like, how? yes, I mean, that would be uh, an emotionally taxing, overwhelming uh, experience for a family. But like a whole book, like about a kid dying of the plague, I was like, I, I don't know. You know, uh, people say it's great. So like people say it's great. So I'm guessing the author found enough to say for a whole book, but I don't think so. I don't think there's a whole book's worth of material here. Anyway, unpopular opinion, as usual, this book is pretty much universally praised. So if you were thinking of picking it up, probably still do, because I'm about the only one that I know of that was not impressed with this. So, And I, I don't think it's bad. I just feel like it's very like, it's just very try hard. And I, I would rather just read an actual biography of William Shakespeare. Oh, <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, it, it was all right. Next up I read Hollow Pox, uh, The Hunt for Morgan Crow by Jessica Townsend. This is the third book in the Nevermore, or the Morgan Crow series. It begins with Nevermore. The series I'm buddy reading with Vish from Books with V. We are loving it. I say that in every wrap up. It's, it's, I feel like I don't say very much about these books in my wrap ups because like I don't, I, I don't feel like it's the kind of thing where I really can say much more than I have because the plot itself, you know, it's it's a middle grade book with like whimsical adventure, fantasy fun. And like, unless I'm going to like go into specifics about who the big bad is and like, like very specific details about sort of like the friendships and the jokes and the quirks of magic. Because that's, I mean, it's a middle grade book. So like, it's not like there's a ton of layers to this. <laughs> it's not like there's uh, multiple aspects to unpack. It's just absolutely perfect for what it is like for a middle grade fantasy book that is for young children to begin to tackle some slightly tougher topics about about people and this one in particular um kind of tackles discrimination immigration uh that kind of thing and it does an amazing job of introducing those topics in a way that is comprehensible palatable and appropriate for the young audience that it's geared towards and can still be enjoyed by adults so i just find this author's writing and the characters and the world to be utterly charming and whimsical perfect age-appropriate fun and that again as an adult I can also enjoy. So I absolutely recommend this series. I cannot recommend it highly enough if you're looking for a whimsical lovely middle grade story that either for your children or to enjoy with your children or to be an adult that has no children and just read it for shits and giggles. <laughs> anyway, Hollow Fox, excellent, cannot wait. 
for the fourth one, but I must wait like an entire year. <laughs> Next up I have a book that is part two of a duology that made my best book of the year, and that is A Radical Act of Free Magic by H.G. Perry. I read Declaration of the Rights of Magicians in November and knew immediately that I was going to be picking up Radical Act. I do think that the Declaration of Rights was a smidge better than Radical Act, but I gave both five stars. I think the the way that it wraps up in this book, like this, the, if, I talked about this quite a bit, but if you don't know what I'm talking about or you have, didn't hear me talking about it, the Declaration of the Rights of Magicians and this book, what is the series called? The Shadow Histories. It's a retelling or a reimagined, an alternate history fantasy where we're, we're, it's the Age of Enlightenment, but retold or reimagined where there is magic. So it's about England and France and the colonies, but with magic. So you have characters from history, William Pitt, Robespierre, uh, Wilberforce, Toussaint Levertour, they appear in these books, but there is magic in this world. And each of them either is encountering magic or is a wielder of magic, or magic is a very real part of this world. Anyway, I think that these books, this duology, is an absolute masterclass in how alternate history fantasy should be written. So much care and attention is paid to the actual history that is being messed with, but there's also, the author has done a really good job of sort of developing the magic and you know, uh, weaving that into what actually happened in history, while also writing, uh, even though these are historical figures, writing them in a way that is compelling and that you can latch on to, more so than a lot of fictional characters that are not pe uh, people from history that I've read about. Again, this one is, is also five stars. I just think that the the wrap-up, how this is all kind of like, how it winds down, the big sort of climax, I don't think it was bad, but it was a, it's a little bit underwhelming. Uh, I don't think it was like quite the like chef's kiss ending that I would have wanted. But it was by no means bad. I wasn't truly disappointed. I was just like, okay. I was like, that wasn't the best ending, but like that was that was absolutely fine. <laughs> and I still think like the book overall is amazing and continues like the project of these books is amazing overall. So the duology as a whole, absolutely recommended. Again, if I had to choose between the two, the first one is slightly better, but the second one is also so good. So if you're like a history nerd who likes a bit of magic thrown in and doesn't mind your books being a little bit more dry, Love this duology. Cannot recommend it highly enough. Next up, I read one of the two books that were our Blades and Bodice Rippers books because we read two in December. <laughs> uh, it's Witchmark by C.L. Polk. Of the two we read, this is the one I liked better, which I didn't like either very much. But um, I believe my co-hosts all liked the other one better. One, Amara, uh, I think, pretty much agreed with me about Witchmark, except that um, while we both agreed about Witchmark being kind of here, <laughs> then uh, she put the other book here and I put the other book here. So like we met in the middle on this one. This was just like better to me than the other one. So this is also alternate history. It's a male male romance with this historical setting and magic. And it didn't help that I read it like right after reading the shadow histories because this kind of tries to use magic to tackle topics of like discrimination and um, classism and that kind of thing. But I just felt like this was such a pale imitation, uh, such a watered down version of what I had just seen done in the Shadow Histories. And then obviously there's like more of a focus on romance here. And I just thought the magic didn't make a whole lot of sense. Like unlike H.G. Perry where like the history was so good and the magic was good. Here I was like, the history is kind of loose and the magic is kind of loose. <laughs> and there's like an attempt at uh, tackling kind of like socioeconomic questions, but like not really much. <laughs> like I just had seen all of these things done so much better in the shadow histories that reading this just felt like you know like just just no it felt like i don't know what a good comparison it felt like a store-bought cupcake after you've been to like a parisian patisserie you're like it's like yeah it's it's sweet there was flour involved it is a dessert but like it's it's not the creme de la creme that is the other book that i had just read so like if you're not such a big history buff, if you want more romance in your books, if you don't care to have like a huge amount of history and detail and like if you don't want all that, if you are happy skimming the surface, then this you'll probably like this better than I did. But I don't like skimming the surface. I never do. So uh, yeah, like I don't I think I gave this three stars. Like it wasn't it wasn't bad. I didn't hate it. But I was like, eh, meh, meh pretty forgettable. Next up I read the bind up um, called Era of Navron, which is in fact a bind up of two books. That's where they split. Um, books five and six in the uh, Rhaeria Revelations. They are Wintertide and Persepolis. 
And this concludes the Rayeri revelations. And then after that comes, well, chronologically it comes before, but in publication order, what comes next is the Rayeri Chronicles. And then again, chronologically it's further back, but in publication order is next is the Legends of the Birth Empire. I have all of those books. <laughs> I feel like Rayeri revelations, like I've been reading this series for like three years now, four years. Um, so like clearly it's not been like pressing. <laughs> It's not something that I've like felt a desperate desire to continue on. Every time I read an installment, I'm like, hmm, that was pretty good. And then I'm like, good. And then, our, you know, several months, many months later, I'll be like, oh yeah, I need to finish that series. So I'll pick up another one. I'll be like, yeah, that was fine. And then I'll read the next one. I'm like, yeah, that was fine. This I liked the least, to be perfectly honest. Wintertide actually was like very seasonally appropriate, which I didn't really realize. I mean, it's called Wintertide, but I mean, it's like kind of about basically like Christmas time. So I was like, oh, this is a good time for reading it. But also like, for the most part, I hate books like that. Like I've never, I mean, I also don't like romances, but like it's usually romances that are kind of like a Christmas romance. And I'm just like, ew, no, I don't like this. But like most books that are like, you know, it feels like the holiday episode or something. So it's like kind of corny, kind of kitschy and cheesy. And it, it kind of felt like that. And as you can see, Wintertide is considerably, Wintertide is considerably shorter than Perseplicus because it kind of feels like the Christmas book. <laughs> I mean, there's more going on, obviously, and it's developing the political situation. I mean, we're quite far into a series, so I can't say too much about it but without being spoilery because this is books five and six. But so f book six concludes the Rayuri revelation. So like the mysteries that have been present since the beginning of the series, the questions are finally answered. And the thing is, it's a it's kind of hard to pin down what the difference is between an ending that you pretty much saw coming but feel satisfying because you feel like it was like really set up and so like it's you're not disappointed because it didn't surprise you it just it feels like yeah and this yeah I mean like the end of Lord of the Rings which actually like that's also in here but the end of Lord of the Rings like I don't feel disappointed that like oh man like Frodo like destroying the ring saw that coming like you know you're just like well yes like that's where this was going and it's satisfying seeing it come to that conclusion but this book or this series, I feel like it tries very hard to kind of like to throw red herrings out there and to try to make you to misdirect you, but not very well. But it's so obvious that the author desperately wants to misdirect you, or doesn't want you to guess the ending so that you will. I guess that's the difference. But like if a book, if you get the sense from a book that it wants to surprise you versus a book that is quite content to just tell you the conclusion of this story and it is the conclusion that is comes naturally after what you've been told so far, if that makes sense. Here, I was like, I've already guessed what this twist is. And you're really dragging out this like misdirect, even though, and like, it's like watching the misdirect just go on and on and on where I'm like, I know this is a misdirect. I know that I already know this. And so we finally like, and there it is, the big revelation that I already guessed. Ooh. It just feels, yeah, so. Um, and then it wasn't even something that I'm like, well, I guessed it, but I mean, it is pretty good. Like, I don't think it's that good of a revelation or a twist, uh, or even that good. Like, I feel like there is so much effort put into trying to misdirect you that it honestly, like, hurts a little bit the logic and continuity of the story. Because, like, some of it, I'm like, this doesn't really make sense for these characters to think and do the things they're doing. Like, they have to be really, they're, they're such idiots <laughs> to, like, not have guessed this. And then some of it is just too neat. Like it comes together way too neatly where it, not just like the big questions are answered, but like a bunch of little things are answered in a way that it's just, it feels very Disney where I was like, okay, yeah, yeah, you did plant that and then pay it off. But in a way that's so contrived where I'm like, uh -huh, okay, yeah, I see what you did there. <laughs> wow. I guess, I guess that did foreshadow that, um, which I, I'm being really vague because like I can't really tell you what any of these things are, but it's the kind of thing where like, you know, someone says uh, a mysterious and enigmatic thing that's unclear and then the payoff for it later is like when you come to understand what that actually meant and like, okay, like I guess, I guess it could mean that and I guess that can be why they said that but that's pretty stupid. <laughs> that kind of thing where, yeah, like to set it up in this way where someone had to have been like really, like why why would they say it so unhelpfully with the, like, I guess with the hope and assumption that someday you would figure out what they meant in the exactly the right context for it. And only in that context would you then look back on when they said that they must have meant this. And it's, it's just very contrived. I'm sorry. I just, I was very irritated with it. So yeah, the ending was just, it was very 
neat cookie cutter wrapping things up and and then and then after we've wrapped everything up it faffs around for pages and pages of pages of just kind of like falling action and what the characters are going to do now and just, you know what their lives are going to be like and I'm like oh my god I don't fucking care is this over yet <laughs> that said I fully intend to read the Rayuria Chronicles which each installment is a lot shorter which gives me hope because part of this it just felt too long it was also his first he first wrote the revelations and I, I mean most authors tend to get better with time so I am excited to read the Rayuria Chronicles which is kind of like a prequel series, um, which should be showing us more just kind of like the heisty adventures of Hadrian and Royce, which is kind of the best part of these books anyway. And we spent a great deal of time with this kind of like big world stuff, which was the part that I thought was the worst written. And so I'm, if the Rayuria Chronicles is more just kind of like adventure of the week, where it's like their heists and escapades, like I'm very much looking forward to that. And then Legends of the First Empire is so way back in the day, it's like a totally different project. And I know Jashana adores that series. And all of the beautiful hardcovers that I own are so pretty that like I'm determined to like it. I will do a great deal of convincing myself that I like it until I give in and admit that I don't, if I don't. Which, by which I mean like, it will be receiving the benefit of every doubt that I can possibly throw at it. But yeah, the ending of Rayuri Revelations left a lot to be desired in my humble opinion. Next up I read The Burning God by R.F. Kuang. And I, I'm, I've become aware that this book is extremely polarizing and that a ton of people love the Dragon Republic and hate the Burning God or they love the Burning God and they hated the Dragon Republic. I, I don't understand why anyone would feel vastly differently about these two books. I feel like I feel exactly the same way about both of them, which is to say, it's fine. <laughs> like, I gave it four stars, which is quite high. And I gave four stars to Dragon Republic, and I'm pretty sure I gave four stars to the Bobby War because of the reason, the exact, I feel like the exact same thing that I had to say about Dragon Republic in my wrap up is what I have to say about the Burning God, is that the project of this, of taking the parts of history and the parts of the world that R.F. Kuang is drawing inspiration from and retelling it in this way with magic and, et cetera, and uh, gender being an, a component, like I think the project of it is a good project and I think the execution of it is, is thorough. But I just feel like the writing itself, the characters are very one note, the whole thing is just kind of very bleak all the time. It, it doesn't, it's not written in a way that for me is all that compelling for that reason, because I'm not really latching onto these characters. And again, I don't mind reading about bad people. In fact, I prefer it. So it's not like, oh, you know, Rin's too unlikable. It's not that she's unlikable. She's just boring to me because all Rin is about is, it's just, she's kind of like Tao from the, what's it called? Um, Rage of Dragons. She's nothing like Tao, but insofar as like Tao is just kind of like, one track mind, that's it. And I'm just like, that's boring to read about. Same with Rin, one track mind, it's boring to read about. And the whole thing is about Rin. And that being said, the characters around Rin, they ha might have slightly different priorities and different interests and different goals and motivations than Rin, but they are also very kind of like one track with what they are each doing. And that's just not that interesting to me to read about. Like, it's not bad. They don't, it doesn't read like, uh, they're not caricatures. But there isn't like a great deal of nuance to unpack with either Rin or any of the side characters or any of their interactions and dynamics. It's very kind of just exactly what you expect the whole time. And there, like towards the end, it does get a bit interesting, but in a way that is utterly predictable. And it, uh, again, in that way of like, I don't, I feel like you want me to be surprised by this and I'm not surprised by this. I don't think that it's bad. I think the way you've written things, you've led me to assume that this is very much possible. But it's just written in a way where like, I, I feel like I'm expected to feel shocked. And I just, I can't get it up. <laughs> um, so reading it, I was just like, yeah, just like with Dragon Republic, I was like, it's, it's fine. I just, it's difficult for me to feel anything about this other than like, you've done a, a very commendable job, R.F. Kuang. <laughs> but I, I feel nothing. <laughs> uh, so... Yeah, I, I would love to love this, but I, I just can't manage that for the aforementioned reasons. So I don't understand why anyone feels vastly differently about Dragon Republic and Burning God, but I don't know. Apparently they do. So next up, I read a book that would have gone on my worst books of the year had I read it before I filmed that. I don't know which one it would have bumped off the list or maybe it would have been a list of 11. I don't know. But um, Portrait of a Scotsman by Evie Dunmore, I, that's it, no more. I keep getting these books from Book of the Month by Evie Dunmore and I have liked each one less. Uh, so that's no more. I've, I've finally, finally learned my lesson. I just, this is, these are all like uh, suffragette romances. So they're all like 
historical romances where each of the ladies is kind of like part of the suffragette movement. They're all kind of blue stockings. And the first book I thought that one I enjoyed uh, at the beginning. I didn't think it was amazing, but I was like having a good time because I thought the banter was pretty good. Uh, it was kind of cute and kind of funny. And then there was this like horrible questionable consent. And I was like, no, no. And so then I was willing, since I liked it, pretty well to start out with and that was her debut novel I was like well I'll read the next one because it doesn't won't necessarily have the same consent issue and like she'll have grown as a writer the second one was just kind of boring to me it was like it was perfectly adequate but I didn't feel any kind of way about it and in a romance you are supposed to feel many kinds of ways <laughs> and I just felt kind of nothing about it and this one Kind of like what I talked about with Witchmark where it's like attempting to tackle some like heavier topics but in a way that's kind of like because the purpose of a romance book, like the thing you're here for is romance. And so it is necessarily the focal point, must be the focal point of what the author wants you to care about. That's the thing that has to be kind of like driving the tension and driving the stakes and the climax. Except then you're trying to use some much more serious things about like socioeconomic disadvantages and problems, etc. as your backdrop. And so they necessarily have to take a back seat to the much pettier concerns of the romance which just feels weird and almost insulting to those topics where I'm like, like, I guess I, the credit goes to you for wanting to tackle those topics. But I'm just like, this is, this isn't the time or place because to actually address those things in a meaningful way, you would have to make them more important and they would necessarily overshadow and overtake any kind of like petty concerns of romance. Or it would turn into a much more serious, dramatic, possibly tragic story, in which case it cannot be shelved in romance because romance has to have a happy ending. That's like part of the deal. And so like, I feel like this is just not the, not the place to do it. I, I don't, I don't know. I, maybe you could, but this isn't it because it makes it feel like it, it's worse. You know what I mean? Like uh, every historical romance is definitely going to be kind of waving away and uh, kind of glossing over some of the uglier sides of this historical time period because you're not going to have fun with like a, an escapist little romance if you actually depict the time period the way that it really was and the way that people's lives really are. No one wants this. And so by bringing in these more serious topics, it's like you're pulling the curtain back from our fun little show to be like, oh, but it, it's, you know, it's actually like really ugly back there. But we're not really gonna talk about it. We're gonna focus on this like fluffy romance. And you're like, but, but I, I can't enjoy this when you're, showing me that and then being like but also like that's not as important as the romance and then the romance itself was terrible it we were back to having not so much consent issues like not specifically consent but just like a problematic romance again where i was like it's very hard to root for this because like it's kind of reprehensible the behavior particularly of the male lead where i'm like that's that's not okay and then the book tries to uh address that in, in a very last minute or like 11th hour kind of climactic twist um where it's like too little too late especially after like socioeconomic things and how those were handled and then this like too little too late addressing of the major tension of the romance where i'm like uh, what and the biggest red flag of them all is how often this book references wuthering heights as idealized romance and any author that either i am aware of because they have spoken about this themselves or it literally writes it into the text that it is referring to Wuthering Heights as an ideal romance. I'm like, no, 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 I thought, can, no, 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 no. Wuthering Heights, classic book, excellent book, can be referenced, can be quoted, is it's good literature. But when it's ref referred to as like, that's how a romance should be, isn't that romantic? Or like having the the romantic leads kind of like either identify parallels or seek to draw parallels between their lives positively between themselves and Heathcliff and Kathy. I'm like, like, unless it's a story about fucked up people being fucked up and you're meant to think it's fucked up. This is a story about like a romance you're meant to root for that you think is great. And it's meant to like, you're meant to see a parallel between Wuthering Heights and it I'm like, no, no. So yeah. Um, Evie Dunmore, I don't think she's the one for me for all those reasons. Next up I read the fifth and final book in the Chronicles of Perdane, The High King by Lloyd Alexander. And I, this is probably my least favorite. I still really liked it. And I still really like the Chronicles of Perdane. I felt slightly about this the way that I felt about 
Persepolis uh, in the Rarier Revelations, but not nearly as bad because this doesn't go out of its way to kind of misdirect. This very much feel is at all times kind of more that Lord of the Rings style where like this is very classic kind of fantasy logic, fairy tale logic, you know, it's a hero's quest and you know, the hero will prevail and the hero will learn lessons and the hero's companions will learn lessons and like it's very traditional in that sense. And so having the end be quite traditional is also not is neither unexpected nor unearned. Like this is what we're kind of set up to expect. But the end just felt a little bit too neat and predictable. And I, I can't really put a finger on why. Because again, with something like Lord of the Rings, I'm like, yeah, like that's exactly where that was going all along and it went there and yeah. Uh, this, I don't know, the way it wrapped up, it just felt a little bit too, too neat. That's really the only word I can use for it. I still give it four stars. I still think it's really good. And again, it's been, it's appropriate for it to be a neat ending. It was just too neat. I don't know how else to say it. And I don't really know how to adequately explain, even if I was to go into spoilers, how it could have done things differently to better satisfy me. I don't know. I just know that that's how I felt when I got to the end where I was like, okay, yeah, like that's, that's a, that's a bit neat. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, again, still really like the Chronicles of Bernadette. Absolutely recommend. And the journey was apparently a little bit better than the destination. A little, little way of King's Easter egg there for you. But uh, yeah, still worthy of reading, still a fun time, still a lovely little world to be in, still wonderful quirky characters. Just, just a bit, a bit cookie cutter and a bit, I guess a bit saccharine is also the, my problem with it, not with the ending. Anyway, still good, it's definitely still good. Next up I read, <laughs> A Marvelous Light by Freya Marski. This is the other Flayth and Vodice Rippers book club pick, which, as I already alluded to, I disliked quite strongly. Um, this was a mess. <laughs> this was sort of pitched as being Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell meets Red, White, and Royal Blue because it is a historical fiction book with romance and with magic. So I... Mm, it is definitely a straight up romance. I mean, it does have magic in it, but the comparison to John Stra Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell led me to believe that it would be more more straddling that line between romance and fiction where obviously there's gonna be a strong romantic current but that it won't be a romance novel and it's published by tor.com not by a romance imprint but this is a romance book which if i had known that i wouldn't have been excited for it suggested it or hyped it or or uh encouraged the ladies to choose it to read i thought it'd be good because i thought it would have romance in it so like so they'd like that and i could i could be fine with that uh, but that wouldn't be the whole point of the book and that is the whole point of the book and then worse still I didn't like either of the romantic leads and I didn't think I didn't like them individually and I didn't think they had very good chemistry the magic was a shit show I was so angry with the magic system because it made no sense and it kept trying to make extra sense like it went out of its way to explain itself to you to the point where I was like you're making it worse stop digging stop digging the hole and I just was so frustrated the entire time and then the historicalness of it was it was, it was often wrong like the prose was bad because there was often sentences where I was like that's incorrect that's that no that sentence is no that's no so I was just pretty deeply aggravated by this the entire time and there was like no part of it where I was like but at least this there was no at least anything the whole thing I was just like I cannot wait for this to be over so yeah that's that's a real quick note from me um but if you want to see more glowing opinions everybody else uh in Blades and Bodice Rippers really liked this and liked it they liked both and they liked this way more than Witchmark. I don't claim to understand. But if you want to see us talk about it, I'll leave a link down below the live show where we chatted about it and uh, they all liked it and I hated it per the usual. <laughs> Next up I read The Clockwork Sparrow by Catherine Woodfine. Um, this is a middle grade mystery. Um, this is a middle grade series of mysteries that are set in sort of like the OG glamorous department store of uh, Edwardian England. And it's just, it was so cute. I really, 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 really enjoyed this. It kind of, I've never watched these shows, but it kind of, you know, has the vibe of like the Paradise or Selfridges because it's this, you know, glamorous old department store. The main character, she works at the department store, but you know, there's nefarious goings on in the department store. And there's a mystery that she gets all kind of like swept up in and is a wrongfully, you know, a suspect in what has gone on. So she's, you know, got to solve it herself uh, to get herself out of trouble. And just the atmosphere and the vibes and the attention to historical detail. <laughs> As I was reading this, this is middle grade historical fiction. And I was like, why does this history feel so much better and more well-researched and more authentic than these adult novels that I've been reading? So I do definitely recommend this. as like a nice, fun, light, 
mystery, historical mystery. Like, it's for kids, so it's not like an incredibly complex layered mystery, but it's a good little mystery. And um, it's got some quirky, nice characters to follow that I feel like you can root for very quickly. It's a fun environment to escape into, and um, I just had a good time. And I definitely intend to read the other mysteries in this series. Next up, I read The Return of the King by J.R.R. Tolkien, the third and final book in the Lord of the Rings trilogy. I know that this is Klaus's favorite, and I will say this is definitely my favorite experience of the three. Full disclosure, this is the only one that I re uh, listened to Andy Serkis read because Andy Serkis recorded new audiobooks for the whole trilogy, but those either, either I wasn't aware they weren't out yet when I did, when I read the first two books. So this one was the only one that I've experienced via Andy Serkis reading it to me, which is an absolute treat. I cannot recommend that highly enough. But that being said, I can, I'm not entirely confident that I, or I, I don't feel, I don't feel like I can tell if I would think this was my favorite if Andy Serkis hadn't read it for me. Like, I don't know if that's the difference, you know, if that makes sense. Like, maybe if I went back and listened to Andy Serkis reading the first two, I'd be like, oh, they're all just as good as Return of the King. Uh, it's really just Andy Serkis reading it that makes it amazing. Or it's Return of the King is my favorite, and Andy Serkis is just like a great way to experience it. I honestly cannot tell. I think that at the very least, I would like this like just as much, maybe slightly more than the first two if it wasn't for the Andy Serkis variable. But Andy Serkis reading The Return of the King was, I mean, I was excited for it and I figured it would be good, but oh my God, <laughs> it was so good. He was born for this. I, I mean, I fully intend to go back and listen to Andy Serkis reading Fellowship and Two Towers and also The Hobbit, because you know, may as well. Oh, so, so good. Yeah, so I, if you're looking to reread it or you read it for the first time and you're into audio, I. Even if you're not into audio, you will be into audio if you listen to Andy Serkis. It's impossible not to. And there were multiple times when I was listening to it that I teared up and uh, it was it was great. Five out of five stars, no question about it. Again, in part, <laughs> some of that credit might go to Andy Serkis and not to R.R. Tolkien, but I had an absolutely amazing time reading this. It was a, It was beautiful. It was emotional. It was chef's kiss and like I'm really kind of relieved because having read the first two I was like I am a huge fan of like Lord of the Rings but if I'm honest a lot of it is that I'm a huge huge fan of the movies and that I've been enjoying the books but it's the movies that have my whole heart and reading The Return of the King or listening to Andy Serkis read The Return of the King I was like oh now I don't feel like a fake fan anymore because The Return of the King as a book as read by Andy Serkis I am here for it, blown away, ready to hype it. So again, I don't know <laughs> how much credit is is to Andy Serkis, but I loved this and I love that I love this. And yeah, uh, yeah, that's all I have to say about that. Next up I read Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens, which I had never read before. I have seen several adaptations of it on film and I've seen it as a stage play, but I'd never actually read the original story. And I mean, most adaptations, including the stage play, pull directly from the book. Like a lot of it, like reading the actual book now, uh, it felt like I'd read it before because, you know, a lot of the text either like is narrated, uh, like actual, like what Dickens's words are, like not, like not dialogue, but the narration of the book is narrated by a narrator in voice in adaptations of it. Uh, and then obviously like famous lines from the characters themselves. Like it feels very much like I had read this before, even though I hadn't. Um, but anyway, I mean, it's a lovely little story that is, you know, tis the season to read it. There's a reason it's a classic. I feel like it still stands the test of time. It had me kind of choking up at the sort of like overall, even though, you know, it's this kind of like saccharine little story. And you know, if you've, I've seen it before. And even if you haven't, you can probably guess where it's going to go, what the big message and meaning of everything will be. But even if you know where it's going, it's kind of like, I mean, I knew where Return of the King was going and I still got emotional about it. So even though I knew where Christmas Carol was going and exactly what beats would occur to get us there, I still felt like emotional because it's like, because it's, it's good. It's, it does its job very well. So uh, yeah, I mean, you can read it in January, but I would say if you haven't read it, then, you know, next Christmas, you know, try reading the original. Next up I read The Mad Ship by Robin Hobb which I buddy read with Mara from Books Like Well. 
I need to film a review for this because it is traditional on my channel to review Robin Hobb books every January now. And Mara and I have absolutely been adoring the Live Ship Trader series and Mad Ship is no exception. Mad Ship is amazing. It's, Mara and I was, were talking about it at length. There's so much to pick apart with it. A lot of it is quite spoilery, like what we were picking apart. It was like specific moments and specific character choices and character lines and like what do we think that means or what do we think that says about the character but there's like so many layers to this you just jam I mean it's a long book for sure but even it is even like even I don't know, like it it still packs a punch like usually I would say that about a short book where like it's short but it packs a punch this is long and it's packing so many punches because yeah, it, it, it never feels like it overstays its welcome it never feels like this is just kind of like filler to have a long book like it every page is just like dripping and drenched with depth and character development and plot development and lore development and it's just I just yeah <laughs> Robin Hobb man I, I wow just wow so I'm very much looking forward to reading the third and final book in the Life Ship Trader series, which Mara and I will be tackling in February, The Ship of Destiny. And, um, and yeah, I just, I cannot say enough good things about Robin Hobb. Next up, I read A Storm of Swords by George R. R. Martin, which is the third book in the Song of Ice and Fire series, as myself, Alex from Alex Nieves, and Jimmy from the Fantasy Network are hosting a read-along for the Song of Ice and Fire. So we talked about A Storm of Swords on Jimmy's channel, where we were joined by special guest, Jim R. R. Martin. Full weird and overalls. Uh, so if you didn't catch that live, that is the uh, replay of it is available on Jimmy's channel. And, um, Storm of Swords, man. There were so many things in this book that all of us were like, oh my God, yeah, that happens in this book too. And that, and that, and that. Oh my God, everything that you think of about Game of Thrones and about A Song of Ice and Fire, all the iconic moments nearly, not, not all, but nearly all the iconic moments are in Storm of Swords. Like talk about packing a punch. Oh my goodness. This is also the first book that you finally get for chapters from Jamie's perspective and he's my favorite character. So like reading this book, I'm like, ah, Jamie, yes, it's time. So I feel like that automatically elevates this book in my estimation because like we finally get Jamie some quality time with him. He's such a fascinating character. Yeah, uh, yeah, this is the, what a ride. <laughs> There's, I think, and um, I believe this is Jamie's favorite book of all time. I mean, I could safely say this is my favorite book in The Song of Ice and Fire. Perhaps uh, Winds of Winter will dethrone it, but you know, we'll see when we get there. <laughs> but yeah, um, it's been, again, an amazing experience rereading these books. I feel like this, the, the room that has been given to breathe kind of between having read the books ages ago, having seen the show quite some time now ago, now coming back to the books, kind of uh, having had a little bit more room to breathe and kind of like set aside and rest those kind of hot emotions about the show, etc. To kind of come back to this and be like, okay, well, kind of like, let's see where this all started. And like, you know what? It's, it's really, really good. And it's the kind of books that really do reward a reread. They're not the kind of books where like, well, you can't really understand it until you reread it, because I hate those kind of books. But they're the kind of books that they do, rereading it is very, very rewarding, because you will catch things that you didn't see before. There are things it's not that you can't understand the whole of the book the first time, but there are th individual things that you can't really have guessed or fully understood the first time through. So like those things, you're like, oh, and like, yeah, like I, I didn't really know what that meant the first time, but well, now I surely do. So I'm having a great time. I believe Alex and Jimmy are as well. So I'm glad we're doing this. Next up, I read Half a War by Joe Abercrombie. This is the third and final book in The Shattered Sea. And I, I don't like the Shattered Sea very much. <laughs> I was really hoping that the third book might be the one that makes me go, actually, but I, I gave every book in the series three stars. Like none of it is bad. None of it is badly written. None of it is badly executed. It's just completely adequate. <laughs> and which, which is so painful to me when it's from Joe Abercrombie because I just expect great things. And there are so many things in these books that I just feel like are the seeds for a truly great story that Joe Abercrombie had he chosen to not pull his punches and to truly flesh out. Like if the, I think it was that this is YA or that he was gearing this towards a YA audience that made him think that he had to really simplify and strip things down and, and make things, it's still dark and violent, but like a lot less so. And I feel like he didn't just make it less violent. He just made everybody more boring. And I was like, you, you can still have intricate, interesting uh, characters like, you can still do that. And I just, the one character that I feel like did get progressively interesting with each book, progressively more interesting with each book was Yarvi. 
he's the main character in the first book and then the second and third books they each kind of follow different protagonists in the same world with following up on the events of the previous book but now centering different people and Yarby's always around in these books he just becomes so much more interesting and enigmatic as a character kind of like off not even to the side he's still a prominent character but he's not the POV character not the main character and I did enjoy watching him grow as a character and become more interesting as we went on but it was the it was like the only part of it it wasn't like in any other Abercrombie book Yarby would be like the most forgettable one here he was the most interesting one which is just like it's very disappointing <laughs> so if you're interested in reading the Shattered Sea I wouldn't say like don't read it but like don't start here if you've heard a lot of things about Abercrombie this this is this is not the Abercrombie that you've heard about. This is fine. It's fine. It's certainly better than a lot of YA that I've read, but it's nowhere near as good as the other Abercrombie that I've read. Second to last, I read The Bear and the Nightingale, reread The Bear and the Nightingale by Catherine Arden um, because uh, it was both the buddy read for me and my patrons and also Evie is hosting a read-along for these books. Um, so this time I did it on audio, which uh, zero out of 10 did not recommend. I had read it twice before as a physical book. Um, so my five star love for it was locked in. Had I not already read it before and read it twice before, this audiobook would very easily have convinced me that I hate this book. <laughs> Don't listen to the audiobook. If you love the audiobook, I'm sorry. You're wrong. It's bad. But the book itself, like I was able to, because I was familiar enough with it, having read it before, that I could, I could kind of like get my brain, just try to, try to ignore the narrator and just kind of like get back to my memories of the story and replace her interpretation with like the real core of it. And like, I feel like the beauty of the writing is utterly lost when the narrator is reading it. It's it's insane how bad she can make such a good book sound. But this is an amazing book. I love it so much. It's one of my favorite. My favorite in the series is Girl in the Tower, but the first one is also five out of five stars and a really good start to the series. I actually just had my chat with my patrons about it today. All of us were kind of gushing about it and all the things it did so right and so well and so much better than so many other books we've seen attempt these things and execute them badly. It is so lush and atmospheric and folk brimming with folklore and vibes. And it's so good. It's so good. <laughs> And last, I read Master of Gin by P.J. Jelly Clark. This was the book that my patrons chose for me to vlog and review for them. And I was quite disappointed with this. Um, I talked about it at length, obviously, in that vlog. Suffice to say, I just feel like this was executed very sloppily. That was like the main thing I kept saying over and over. There was other problems I had with it. But the main thing I kept saying was like, this just feels very sloppy and feels very rushed and careless. Um, there's a lot of mistakes in the prose. There's a lot of mistakes in, in like choice of words. It just, it feels very try hard about things. It's very rushed. The kind of misdirects it tries to do with the mystery are again, sloppy. And so I, I really wanted to love this, this book and this world, but I just feel like the author kind of like doesn't let you marinate in any of it. It doesn't let you marinate in the characters, in the world, in the lore, in the mystery. It just keeps rushing from thing to thing to thing. And honestly, this book reads like a video game, which is not a compliment. So yeah, it, I was very, very let down. But the concept is cool. There were parts, like individual moments in it where I was like, I'm kind of enjoying that. That was kind of fun. That was kind of interesting. But overall, I just feel like, yeah, I, I feel like the, the concept is cool. But, and if this was like a first draft, they'd be like, you've got something here, but you really need to work on it. Um, but as a final product, hmm. No. So those are all the books that I read in December. Let me know in the comments down below your thoughts and feelings about my thoughts and feelings. Whatever you want to let me know. I post videos on Saturdays. Other random times as well, but also Saturdays. So like and subscribe. Join my Patreon if you feel so inclined. And I'll see you when I see you. Bye.